throughout this series that we've been in in talking about reconstruction, we have uh, spent a good amount of time talking about the process of approaching any sort of a project. And I know for a fact that for some of you in this room, it's not exactly been the most thrilling of conversations. Uh, maybe you've never really considered how much thought and and development and work went into just a simple thing as like a, your nightstand that you have sitting next to your bed or the table that you eat your meals from or the cabinets that hang up in your kitchen. Maybe you've never considered that until today and maybe there's part of you that wishes we never did have to consider that but uh, I'm the one talking. So, uh, But as we come to the end of this series today, I don't know how we could possibly continue on without discussing what I consider to be the second best part of every woodworking project. As you recall, a few weeks ago, I told you that my favorite part of every project is when we get started. When the planning is finally finished, when you've, you've gotten all the math done and you're ready to actually put wood to saw, that's my favorite part. But the second best part of every single project I've ever done is when the project is done. <laughs> When I've gone through every headache that I'm going to have for this particular project and it's finally getting out of my shop and maybe it's going to somebody else's place and I'm going to have to tell that person this week that I'm never going to make another one of these again. Um, yeah, it's been a rough project. But it's, it's my second favorite part because the, the final nail has gone into the board. The, the last little bit of sanding is finally finished. That last stroke of finish has been applied. It's so great and so fulfilling. All the headache and the, the heartache that has gone on with this is finally, finally done. But that's never really the end. I'm not saying that the project itself continues on, but, but what happens is when you finish a project is now that project enters into a brand new phase. And I call this phase the phase of usefulness. See, we talked about a few weeks ago that if you're going to build a project, you don't do it without first establishing a need for the project. And so once the thing is done, now it is finally able to be used. You don't make cabinets for the sake of making cabinets. You make cabinets so you have a place to put your dishes and put your food and have that random junk drawer that everybody's got that you just throw all, everything you can't think of where to put into that. You don't make a jewelry box for the fun of making a jewelry box. You make a jewelry box so that your wife has someplace really nice to store all the jewelry that you bought her for Mother's Day. Right, fellas? Mother's Day. You're out of time, man. You don't make a kitchen table just to be able to make a table to step back and look at it and go, oh, what a great table. You make the kitchen table so that way well, you got some place to throw all your mail and your kids have got a place to throw their sweatshirts. That's what it's there for. Without a purpose for the project, then the project itself is kind of pointless. All the work that goes into it is kind of meaningless. It has to serve some kind of a purpose to it. A couple of years ago, um, I needed what is called a miter stand. A few years before that, Mandy had bought me for my birthday a miter saw, one of the most useful tools in all of woodworking. I didn't have one. She bought me one because she's an amazing wife. But for a long time, I had to just kind of measure things and draw a line on the, on the board itself and then try to cut it right on that line. And that makes doing cuts of the same size really, really difficult. But if I was able to build myself a miter stand to be able to place my saw on it, I could build a fence there, put a stop block on it, and I could make all the cuts of that size I wanted to. I could spend all day cutting boards the same size. I don't know why I would want to do that, but, you know, I could. So I, I did all the stuff that I do. I, I figured out a couple of different plans. I looked at a few things online to see what other guys were doing and what I wanted my miter stand to be. I, I purchased all the product that I needed for it, a sheet of plywood, a bunch of two by fours, things like that. And I got to work and, and making this particular miter stand, at least the table portion of it really didn't take that long. And then I decided to go ahead and build the fence backing for it. And I cut in a T track into it. So that way I could have a a sliding block to be able to be nice and easy and be able to move that as quickly as I needed to. The, really, the trickiest part was getting the miter saw itself to be level with that tabletop, so that way, you know, when the stand of it itself, is, it's all, nobody cares. Okay, cool. <laughs> but then just to be a little bit extra, I decided to go ahead and put tape measuring for that block to sit on on both sides of the miter saw. Did I need to be able to measure and stop on both sides of my miter saw? No, but now, you know, I can. 
I was so excited when it was done because now I knew I had something that would be useful. But if I had just stopped there, if I had made the miter stand and then never used it, what was the point? What would I have really accomplished in there besides wasting several hours of my life? And about $120. If I didn't use it and it just sat there, yeah, it looks nice, at least to me, but it's not doing anything. Until I put that first board onto that miter stand, until I put that saw down on that board, it hadn't served its purpose. Now I can tell you for a fact that it has become the most used part of my woodworking shop, without a doubt. But if I didn't use it for its purpose, then it was kind of pointless to make it in the first place. I don't really know why anybody would want to make something that didn't serve at least some kind of a purpose. I think the same applies even when we're talking about some sort of a reconstruction. If you remember back to our earliest discussions in this series, we talked about, again, that idea that you have to have a need in order for the project to take place. And especially if you're going to do a reconstruction of some kind, whether it be to restore an old piece of equipment or an old table or something along those lines, you have to first see the need to do it. You're going to restore this in the hope that it can once again be useful to you. That it can once again serve the purpose that it once did. If you're, if you're just restoring something for the sake of restoring it, then that's... I mean, you can do that, but why? It's kind of pointless to do something like that. But just because a reconstruction is finished, it doesn't mean that the work is done. It simply means that now it's ready to be in a place to fulfill the purpose that it was intended for. The same is true when it comes to the reconstruction of our faith. When we talk about this place of, of needing to rebuild our faith, of we've reached a point where something has broken down or something has not gone right, Understand, there are a lot of different reasons to feel the need for a reconstruction. Maybe it's, maybe it's as simple as you, you've kind of drifted so far away from God that you don't recognize who you are anymore. And you know you need to turn back. You know you need to get back to that place where your relationship with God is in a, in a healthy environment. Or, or maybe it's in a place where you've spent your entire life being told a certain thing about your faith. And, and now you're starting to wonder, do I actually believe that? There are good and, I would even say, honorable reasons to undergo a reconstruction of one's faith. But when you reach that point in that faith, in that reconstruction, and in that rebuilding, and in that recommitment to God, at a certain point, that faith has to go out and serve its ultimate purpose. And when we get to our text today, we're going to be in Ezra chapter 6, the Israelites are finally in that place. We've been spending a lot of time throughout this series in the book of Ezra, and last week we spent a little bit of time in, in Haggai, understanding that both of those books are talking about the same time period. But when we left things off with, with Haggai, everything was kind of in a place. Let me, let me recap of where we've been, though, so that way you know. See, the Israelites had been off in a Babylonian exile. They'd been taken from Jerusalem, from Israel, and they'd been made to live in a foreign land. And they were do had done so simply because they'd spent generations worshiping false gods. And I don't know if you know this, I don't know if you're aware of the Big Ten of God's rules, but one of them is don't have any other gods. And so when the Israelites failed to do that, the God decided to allow the Babylonians to come and take them away from the promised land of God. And they spent 70 years in exile, 70 years away from God. And while they were there, during the course of that 70-year period, they began to experience a spiritual reawakening, a recognition of, oh man, we let things get too far. We need to recommit, we need to rededicate ourselves towards God. And so while they're in this foreign land, there is a whole spiritual rebirth that takes place among the Israelites. It's beautiful. It's powerful. Until finally, after 70 years, a group of them are allowed to go back to Jerusalem with the express purpose of going to rebuild the temple of God. Can you imagine that kind of excitement? For 70 years, I know I've, I've said that phrase over and over again throughout this whole series, 70 years, but I really want you to let that sink in. 70 years where the house of God, the place that everyone in Israel pointed to as this is the place where we go to worship God. This is the place where we find the presence of God. This is where we as a people come together to do something that you and I probably take for granted, to go and to worship God. For 70 years, it has sat in ashes. 
there has been no house of God. And so finally, after 70 years and the spiritual reawakening, a group of them are told, go back and go build your temple. That's hugely exciting. They're, they're overwhelmed with emotion in that. It takes another two years of planning before they're finally ever actually put a couple of boards together. And when that happens, it is so exciting and so thrilling for them that when they just get the foundation of the temple itself laid, they erupt into a loud and passionate worship of God. It's incredibly moving and exciting and exhilarating. This is the best time for them. But like we said, that's where discouragement's going to start coming in. See, a group of Samaritans, some people who'd been led to the land of Israel and told to stay there, who not only worshiped the God of Israel, but also worshiped a bunch of idols, the same thing that got the Israelites in trouble in the first place, that caused all their grief and their misery for generations say that they want to come and rebuild. And when the Israelites say, no, we don't want anything to do with you because we're worried about the influence you're going to have on us, then the Samaritans say, well, then you're not going to build it either, buddy. They use fear. They use intimidation. They use political influence to be able to do everything they can to get rid of the, the idea of finishing the temple. Their discouragement is so effective that the temple of God that they were so excited to build initially sits unfinished for 10 to 15 years. A partial reconstruction, sitting unmoved for a decade to a decade and a half. And where we left things off in, in Haggai, we, we talked about this notion that, that God had some tough love for the Israelites. That they'd been sitting in that discouragement for so long that God himself finally felt the need to say something about it, to do something to stir them out of this, this discouragement and this almost self-pity that the Israelites were dealing with. And he did so. He gave them some hard words, but he also told them, I'm going to be with you. We're going to walk through this together. We're going to get through this together. And when we left things off in Haggai chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, where it says, The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They began work on the house of the Lord of armies, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. It was an exciting place to leave off, right? Because now they're finally getting back to it. They're finally going to make this happen. But understand this reconstruction, it was discouraged not just by physical intimidation, but also by political influence. And so if they were going to actually get started on this rebuild, they needed to have the highest authority that they possibly could say definitively, yes, get back to it. And so what we find out in... in Ezra chapter 5 and into chapter 6 is that the Israelites themselves, they actually sent word to King Darius of Assyria saying, hey, your predecessor, King Cyrus, he sent us back here to rebuild this temple, but we've had some monkey wrenches get thrown in our path. These people who are outside of us are trying to prevent us, and we need you to, to confirm that yes, in fact, we're supposed to do this. And so King Darius, being a, a reasonably smart man he goes back and he looks at all the records he wants to make sure that if he's going to make a declaration go ahead and rebuild it that that's actually what they were told to do it's kind of like when your dad would check with your mom did you tell the kids they could go over to their friend's house today <laughs> but all this stuff that takes place and and they finally get this this point of of where Darius finds out that not only is it confirmed, but absolutely they need to get to rebuilding it. And so we pick up the narrative in Ezra chapter 6, and we're going to start in verses 8 through 10. Here's what Darius decrees. He says, I hereby issue a decree concerning what you are to do, so that the elders of the Jews can rebuild the house of God. The cost is to be paid in full to these men out of the royal revenues from the taxes of the regions west of the Euphrates River, so that the work will not stop. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, and lambs for burnt offerings to the gods of the heavens, or wheat, salt, wine, and oil, as requested by the priests in Jerusalem, let it be given to them every day without fail, so that they can offer sacrifices of pleasing aroma to the God of the heavens and to pray for the life of the king and his son. This is huge, right? Not only are they allowed to go ahead and get back to that rebuild, not are they finally allowed to stop looking at this partially constructed temple like they have for at least 10 years, but the king even actually goes on to say, whatever you need, you got. Whatever resources that you need, I got the check. 
That's like somebody saying, I really want to build a house. Let me go to the state and ask for permission. And the state says, well, not only can you build the house, we're going to cover the full cost of it. You don't need a mortgage. Wouldn't that be fantastic? I wish somebody would do that for me. He's making sure that they get everything possible. And not only do they get the the, the financial resources necessary to finish this reconstruction, but he's giving them everything that they need in order to worship God. Everything in order they need in order to sacrifice to God. They've they've had to come up with this on their own to scrape and to claw for years to be able to offer sacrifices for God. And now the king is saying, go ahead and do it. His only one and only really condition for them here is just make sure you pray for me and my kids. This is huge. But understand, the Samaritans are probably still not going to be real happy that this temple rebuild is being allowed to happen. And now they're not going to be really happy that it's being allowed to happen because the king said so. So what about them? Are they still going to try to discourage? Are they still going to try to get in the way? Are they still going to try to make sure that this temple rebuild does not happen? Well, Darius goes ahead and covers that. We see it in Ezra 6, verses 11 and 12. I also issue a decree concerning any man who interferes with this directive. This is, this is intense. Let a beam be torn from his house and raised up. He will be impaled on it. That is so cool. <laughs> his house will be made into a garbage dump because of this offense. May the God who caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who dares to harm or interfere with this house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have issued the decree. Let it be carried out diligently. Whoa. Understand that for 10 to 15 years, these people got in their way. And now the king himself is saying, you're done. So much so that if anybody gets in the way, they're going to be impaled on a beam from their own home, and then that home is going to be turned into a garbage dump. It's going to ruin your legacy as a person. That is intense, right? That's some Game of Thrones stuff. I don't really know. I never watched the show, but I'm told it's a lot like that. That's so intense. He's he's making sure that there's nothing getting in the way of this reconstruction, that the the people of Israel are finally going to be able to have the house of God rebuilt in their place, and that nothing is going to stand in the way, that this project is going to get done. And it does. Oh, man, does it ever. There is nothing getting in the way. After 70 years of waiting in exile, after two years of planning, After 10 to 15 years of obstacle after obstacle after obstacle being thrown in their way. Finally, verses 14 and 15. So the Jewish elders continued successfully with the building under the prophesying of Haggai. Hey, we know that guy. And Zechariah, the son of Ido. They finished the building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and King Artaxerxes of Persia. This house was completed On the third day of the month of Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. It took him four more years of construction. Remember in Haggai, it said they started rebuilding it again in the second year of Darius. They completed it in the sixth year. Four more years of actually building, but finally, after all this time, it is finished. Can you imagine? Just just take a moment and try to place yourself in the shoes of the guy whose job it was to put the last piece in the last place. To set that stone or to nail that board or to do whatever it was and then take a step back and just look around, soaking it all in, and finally utter the words that everybody's been waiting to hear, guys, I think we're done. I think we got it. Can you imagine being one of these exiled people from from Babylon brought back to Jerusalem to finally be given the word that the temple of God, the thing that you thought maybe was never ever going to happen in your lifetime, it's finally ready. The tears of joy of understanding that the house of God has finally returned. 
that we have a place as a people and as a community that we can come and gather together and worship. And folks, I know I said it already, but I, I really think it's true. We take that for granted. For entire generations of people, there was no place for the Israelites to come and gather and worship their God. To finally have that after this huge spiritual reconstruction finally made physical and finally done, that they get a place to come and to stand and to be and worship their God. Can you imagine how overwhelmed with emotion that these people were? It says in verse 16, then the Israelites, including the priests and the Levites and the rest of the exiles, they celebrated the dedication of the house of God. I love that Ezra puts this in here too, with joy. How could they possibly react any differently? How could they possibly feel anything other than joy at this moment? But now that the temple is done, now that it's finished, now that it's completed, now that the last stuff is in there, it's still got that new temple smell to it. It's a good smell. Do they just walk away, slapping themselves on the back, congratulating themselves on a job well done? No. You don't build a temple just to build a temple. Now that temple is finally ready to be used, now it's finally ready to have the people of Israel gather together to sing to God as one, to worship, to sacrifice, to, to just sing his praises, to, to make these brand new walls start to vibrate with the sound of their joy. Their relationship with God is finally in a position to where it can actually go and fulfill the purpose. This reconstruction, physical from spiritual, it's now finally done. And they can come and they can gather and they can worship. They use it. They put it to action. Verses 19 through 22 says, The exiles observed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. All the priests and Levites were ceremonially clean because they purified themselves. They killed the Passover lamb for themselves, their priestly brothers, and for all the exiles. The Israelites who returned from exile ate it, together with all who had separated themselves from the uncleanliness of the Gentiles of the land in order to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. They observed the festival of unleavened bread for seven days with joy, because the Lord had made them joyful, having changed the Assyrian king's attitude towards them, so that he supported them in the work on the house of the God of Israel. This is beautiful, Right? This is a beautiful picture of a people who have been through everything for so long, finally able to come and to worship and to have these religious rituals that they've not been able to have for such a long time. And so it would be easy for us to look at this whole picture of them coming together and celebrating and using the temple and having this great moment. It'd be easy for us to look at this as the end. It's almost cinematic, right? We've gone through all of this. They're finally together, they're joyful, they're having a great time, they're worshiping God, roll credits. But that's not the end. See, all that's happened is now the, the project that they've spent so long dreaming about and so long waiting for and so long building and getting discouraged from building and then building again, it's now finally in the place where it is useful where it can fulfill its purpose. It is in a connection point with God and the Israelites where finally the temple itself can happen. This They've wrestled with it for generations, but now this reconstruction is so solid that they cannot go back. We've talked about this before. And I, I, when I heard this, when somebody pointed this out to me, it, it kind of blew my mind. Because again, for so many generations before this, the Israelites wrestled with idol worship. Right? It kind of creeped its way in towards the end of Solomon's reign. We talked about what a great King Solomon had been for a long time until the end. His kids kind of picked up where he left off, and that idol worship became rampant to where all of a sudden following God was no longer the social norm. You were the outcast if you did so from the people of God. It escalated to point after point after point to where this one particular sin spanned generations of Israelites. But now that this temple is done, 
Now that they have gone through all of this spiritual reconnection and the spiritual rebuilding and the spiritual reconstruction, now that it is finished, the nation of Israel never again wrestles with the same sin of idol worship. I don't know about you, but I got a few things in my own life that I'd really like to say, and then never again. But that is how connected they are to the heart of God, that their their spiritual reconnection and spiritual reconstruction has reached this pinnacle point to where they never again go back. And not only are they fulfilling their purpose in, in being connected with God, they're also fulfilling their deeper purpose to bring others back to Him. Again, in verse 21, It said the Israelites who had returned from exile ate it. And don't miss this part. Together with all who had separated themselves from the uncleanliness of the Gentiles of the land in order to worship the Lord their God. Understand, we've said this before, but, but I think we need to retouch on it. When the Israelites were taken from Jerusalem, from the nation of Israel, not everybody got taken. There were some who were left behind. And they were left behind in a land filled with other people who were idol worshiping. They were still probably wrestling with it themselves and still struggling with that and still dealing with that sin. But now that they have seen this this exiled group come back and they've seen the house of God change their hearts to the point that now they're building the house of God. It has changed their own hearts. These people who have wrestled with this in this land for so long because of the work that has been done with their reconstruction... Their newfound reconnection with God is now being fulfilled in the purpose of bringing others back to God. Their brothers and sisters who were left behind are now being reconnected because of what has happened. It's reigniting their hearts with the hope and the peace and the love that only God himself can bring. Without fulfilling the whole purpose of the reconstruction, the reconstruction itself would have been hollow. If they had gone through all of this just to build a building and then walk away from it, then all of that struggle for over, what, 90 years was pointless. If all they accomplished was just to build a building, to leave it alone and never see its purpose fulfilled, then it would have all been pointless. If we go through that period of reconstruction... But that reconstruction doesn't lead us towards working to fulfill the purpose of our faith? Then what's the point? If we struggle so hard to find ourselves reconnected with God and find ourselves recommitted to Him, but we're not fulfilling out the purpose of our faith, then we're missing the point of the reconstruction to begin with. We're missing the point of seeking out that recommitment. Understand, reconstruction can and oftentimes does, in an absolutely beautiful way, lead to lasting change. But it also has to fulfill a purpose. If we reach the point where we're in a place in that reconnection with God, where we feel more solid than ever before, but we're not striving to fulfill the purposes of that faith, then what was the reconstruction for to begin with? That leads us to kind of the obvious question, and and I mean... I'm going to be real with you. I think this question is kind of so obvious that I doubt very sincerely that many of you have ever thought about it. Whether you're in the middle of a reconstruction or you've stayed in your faith the entire time, you may have never ever considered the question, what is the purpose of our faith? What's the point? Right? I bet if I asked how many of you have actually thought about that question, not too many of you are going to raise your hand. Maybe a couple. But what is the purpose of faith? If we're going to profess to have this faith within ourselves, if we're going to eventually come to a point where we are connected with God, whether that be a reconnection or a brand new connection for the first time, what's the purpose of that? Simply as I can put it, the purpose of our faith is to know and draw closer to God, our Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ, and to invite those around us to do the same. I'll say it again, because I hope this sinks in. Maybe you need to grab a scrap piece of paper and write this down, because maybe you've never thought about this before. That's okay. The purpose of our faith is to draw closer to God our Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and to invite those around us to do 
the same. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. We have a tendency in our faith to view it as a personal relationship with God. And while there is absolutely 100% a personal element to our faith, we make it far too personal. We make it far too individual. See, I'm going to guess that as I gave you my definition or the, the definition of what the purpose of faith is, that you really like the first part of knowing and drawing closer to God. We like that part. Probably didn't like the second part, though. To invite others to do the same. That part's challenging. That part's difficult. Because it means being vocal about our faith. It means being vocal about sharing the hope that we have. It means being vocal about the reconnection that we've established with God. It means telling other people about that. I'm not telling you anything new, right? You've heard me at least 40 times, I'm guessing, say something similar to this in a sermon. I'm not telling you anything new. But until we seep into that notion, until we are willing to fulfill every part of our purpose... And what's the purpose of our faith? I heard it explained years ago. I really wish I could remember who told this to me because I thought it was brilliant then. I think it's brilliant now. I don't remember who said it, though, so I can't give him credit. But it wasn't me. But he said, if this relationship is not impacting these relationships, then there's a disconnect. I'll say it again, if this relationship, if our relationship with God the Father is not impacting our relationships with the people that we surround ourselves with every day, then there's a disconnection somewhere. Because we as the people of God are not fulfilling our purpose. You and I are called by God, by His Son, and by His Holy Spirit to go and to share the joy and the hope and, and everything that we get from God, the grace, the mercy, the peace, everything. If we claim to have that hope within ourselves, if we claim to have that joy within ourselves, then how can we possibly keep silent about it? Again, the joy that the Israelites were going through, these exiles brought back, the joy that they were experiencing in their reconstruction of the temple was so palpable that those who'd been left behind, who were still mired in idol worship, were transformed by it. They saw what the Israelites had, they saw what these exiles had, and they wanted it for themselves. And so as a nation, they walked away from the sin that had encapsulated them for generations. Never to go back again. If we have that same hope and that same joy and that same connection and that same reconnection with God, how can we possibly keep it to ourselves? If we've gone through this transformation of our own, if we've gone through this reconstruction of our own faith, but we're not seeking out to live out the purpose of our faith, then what have we really accomplished? Jesus would speak about our need to fulfill this purpose in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, and we'll close with it today. He said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. I love the practicality of this next part. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. <laughs> Why would you light the lamp and then put it on a basket? Rather, we put it on a lampstand, and it gives light for all those who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. 